Good evening, everybody. Um, this is Catherine Lambrecht. This is our mid-May program. Uh, one that is coming to us via the suggestion from Kelly Bauer. And thank you very much because suggestions are always welcome. They, it may take a while to get to it, but they're always welcome. So our program tonight is Anna Henning who's a self-taught micro-enthusiast, which pretty much describes most of us here, and is a native New Englander currently living in Oregon. Uh, led by curiosity, Anna began learning about mushrooms in 2014 when they happened to be living in an incredibly diverse fungal region of central Massachusetts, and began sharing that knowledge online through Instagram under the name Breakfast of Champignons, very French, in uh, 2018. And for the last year, Anne has been sharing most Mondays about etymological roots and the meanings behind scientific mushroom names in an effort to make binomial nomenclature more accessible to the non-scientific community. A historically picky eater, Anna enjoys finding, photographing, and learning about mushrooms even more than eating them. And Anna's favorite fungi are the Griffula frondosa, also known as maitake or head of the woods. Oh, the Colostoma cinnabarium. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but that's the stalked uh, puffball. And oh, I'm not even gonna try the next two. Uh, just forget it. You're gonna have to do it yourself. And her motto is always be looking, always be learning, which is not a bad way to live. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm turning it over to you. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to this today. Uh, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, just some background on myself. Um, I'm from Massachusetts, as was mentioned in the intro, but uh, after Ellis Island, my father's part of the family did come from Illinois. So I have a lot of love for Illinois. Um, I got started, what, like in 2014, just learning about mushrooms. And about a year ago, I got uh, really interested in learning about the etymology of mushroom names. Um, and, and as was mentioned, I post about it on Instagram. If you're interested in following along with that or learning about mushrooms along with me now that I've moved to the Pacific Northwest, uh, you can feel free to uh, follow me on Instagram and go along for those adventures. Uh, the reason that I invented or, or or started getting curious about etymology and mushroom names was uh, because I was, you know, doing like we all do and getting on the Facebook pages and learning about mushrooms. And I noticed um, that there was a little bit of animosity between people who tended to use common names and people who tended to use scientific names. There was a little bit of push and pull there. And um, I did engage in some conversations with people in like direct messages about it. You know, why, why do we have to use these snooty big words? Like, why can't we just use these common, easy to remember um, names that we know? And, and so I kind of thought, you know what, this is a great opportunity to help people um, understand a new concept using information they already know and are familiar with, even though they might not know Latin or they might not know scientific language, um, become more comfortable and to sort of take the stigma and to take the um, intimidation factor out of learning scientific language. Because as you all I'm sure know, it's so incredibly important when it comes to communicating and making sure that you're on the same page as somebody else, because you know, um, there's a big difference between uh, a toxic amanita and a non-toxic amanita, but all, if you, all you know if it's an amanita, you can't really necessarily communicate that information. So uh, I, inv I invented at a Monday on Instagram as a way to sort of make it more accessible to everyone, everybody, um, because it is such an important concept to be familiar with and to be comfortable with. Some words that I think are helpful to know uh, just to begin with, is taxonomy, which is the science and process of naming living organisms like plants, animals, fungi, etc. Um, a fact that you might already know is that mushrooms were considered to be plants up until 1969 when they were given their own kingdom or queendom, if you're into, into that sort of thing. Um, and so it was, uh, you'll notice that a lot of times when it comes to the language that's used for mushrooms, you'll, you'll see botanical words that are used, words that are better used applied to plants, and it's because for so much of history, they were considered plants before they knew any better. 
Um, another interesting uh, factoid to become comfortable with using is binomial nomenclature. That is the language of taxonomy. Binomial means two names and nomenclature means um, name called out. So it's really redundant, two names called out. Um, essentially they're pairs of words or compound words, which you know, we already use these in everyday language. We have hypothesis, rainbow, submarine. Um, there's a lot of words we already use, which is two words put together. Um, to create a different meaning. And some binomials are already well known to the general public, such as Homo sapiens or Tyrannosaurus rex. So you can see there, those are both pairs of Latinized words um, that become the taxonomy of things in order to classify them with science and be really specific about it. Now, you might be wondering, hey, don't you mean the Latin name? Uh, I, have, I have sort of a strong, a strong feeling about this. Um, and while you know binomial nomenclature is like a mouthful, I do encourage people to say scientific name rather than Latin name. Um, science uses Latin the way Papa Gino's uses Italian food, so it's based off of it, but it's definitely not the same thing. Um, and the you know the elite religious and academic history that gives Latin its prominence in science as the language of science does rub some people the wrong way. Um, and the convenience of having a neutral ground by which anyone, regardless of nationality, whatever country you're from, whatever region of the United States or wherever you might be from, you know, you can be Swedish talking to a German person. And if you're using that um, scientific binomial, you can be sure that you're talking about exactly the same thing, whether it's a plant or a fungus or an animal, et cetera. Um, so it has its perks um, and you don't have to know Latin to know scientific names. It definitely helps to understand what you're saying. Um, and I think that knowing the meanings of these words helps us to remember what is otherwise a, like a really complicated, you know, lots of syllables, really foreign sounding word. And so that's why I like to do this is I like to make it really interesting. And I like to connect ideas that you're already familiar with. Um, you might not know Latin, but you know some of the words that come from these Latin roots or Greek roots or whatever languages they might be from. All right, so you'll all recognize this if you grew up um, before 2000. It is Wiley e. Coyote, and at the beginning of every episode, they love to put in these made-up scientific binomials uh, for the coyote carnivorous vulgaris, uh, roadrunner accelerati, incredibilis. They come up with different ones every time, but they, the idea is there. This is a perfect example of Latinization. They're taking uh, words that you know and are already familiar with, and they're sort of Latinizing them or making them sound more Latin-y. So Roadrunner, Accelerati, Incredibilis. So he's incredibly fast. He accelerates incredibly fast. Um, and while this is a joke, this is very much how mushrooms were named by taxonomists. Uh, it, involves, it involves taking words which could be Latin, but they could be other languages too, and making them sound latin -y. And it's, it's for continuity. It really does make sense if you think about it. Um, so sometimes they name uh, mushrooms. We're, we're, obviously, they can name a lot of things, but we're talking about mushrooms here, so we're going to stick with that. Uh, they name fungi after a place or a person. So you're going to see a specific epithet, which is the second word in the Latin binomial. The first word is the genus, and is the general. They come from the same root, the general idea, the general family which it's in. And then the specific epithet is exactly what it sounds like. It's much more specific, and that has to do with the species. And again, those words sound familiar because they're all etymologically related. So for example, here we have Postia, named for a Hampus van Post. Uh, Phaelus Schweinitzii, the Dyer's polypore, named for Louis David de Schweinitz. Exo, Exudoporus frostii, uh, previously had different name, but um, Exudoporus frostii, named for Charles Christopher Frost. That's the apple bolete. I don't know if it grows in your area, but somebody noticed the last time I gave this talk that a lot of my mushrooms are from the East Coast. And because I lived there up until recently. And then last but not least, we have Mycena Leia, which um, is named for Thomas Leia, who is a gentleman. Um, you can also have fungi that are named after places. Uh, these names are usually lowercase because they are a specific epithet and the specific epithet is always lowercase. The genus is uppercase. The specific epithet, the second word in the binomial is lowercase. So uh, you have names like Californicus, Idahoensis, Oregonensis, Mendocinensis, Septentrionale, which means Northern, or Occidentalis, which means Western. So that gives you a clue about you know, where they're found. Um, and then you have 
specific epithets that have more to do with association. So again, telling you a little bit something about the mushroom or the fungus that you're looking into, like Bryophilus, which is oak loving, or Tsuge, which is a hemlock tree, or Betulina, a birch tree, or Porcophilus, which is oak loving, you know, Phyllis, Philia, love, a word that you'll probably recognize. Uh, another concept I just want to make you familiar with right off the bat is something called PIE. It is not PI. I'm sorry if it makes you hungry. Um, PIE is short for Proto-Indo-European, and it is the theorized common linguistic ancestor of the Indo-European language. It is theorized because there is no record of writing, because as you can see, Proto-Indo-European 5000 BC uh, people weren't writing things down then, and um, they didn't have Google Drive to keep things in. So this is just a uh, family tree of all the languages that are considered Indo-European to give you just an idea, because a lot of times the root words that we're going to be talking about, yes, they might be Latin, or they might be Greek, or they might be Arabic, or, or any other number of things. Um, but before that, linguists theorize a mother language that created and, and branched off into all those different languages, which is really fascinating if you think about it. All right, so before we get into some actual genera and talking about what they mean, I just wanna go into some common suffixes because a goal for this, I hope that you walk away with just a general idea of some of the building blocks that you can now look at uh, binomials and say, ooh, I kind of actually know what that means or I'm familiar with that concept. So uh, let's begin with aceus, iodes, um, oides, opsis, and otis. What they all mean is having the resemblance of resembling, and it's relating to ops, which is a word meaning eye. So if you think of the word cyclops, that's ops, that's the eye right there in the middle. Um, some genus names that you might be familiar with that utilize this suffix are pleurotus, which we will touch back on later, um, caprinus macaceus. Uh, cornucopia edes, ooh, I said it on the first try, uh, and phylotopsis, and there's, there's actually a lot of um, specific epithets that use this suffix in them, but now you know what it means. It means having the appearance of or resembling. Uh, another really common suffix is asins, essens, isins, uh, and it means becoming, and it comes from the word nascens, meaning to become. So some mushrooms you might be familiar with are obviously psilocybe cyanescens, meaning to become blue, which makes sense, right? Because that's a mushroom which when you bruise it, it becomes blue. Another one, which is one of my favorite ones that Catherine mentioned earlier, uh, gyroporus cyanescens. So, and I actually have a little video right here of one that I found at home. And you can obviously see why it's called cyanescens, why it's called um, a mushroom that turns blue. So we'll just watch that real quick. The common name for this mushroom is the cornflower bolete, which refers to the color of the outside of it, which really belies the incredible, brilliant blue that it turns the moment it oxidizes with oxygen. Look at that. Mm, I love it. And it's edible. So that's really cool. Let's see if I can get out of here. So you won't have to watch it again. All right. Another common suffix that you'll see when you're looking through your guide and you're, you're working on identification is formis, formosa, or formosus. This means full of or in the shape of, and it's from Latin forma, meaning form or shape, and osis. Um, so originally formosus meant beautifully formed. And something that I absolutely love about this word is if you speak Spanish or you're familiar with Spanish, you know that hermosa or hermoso means beautiful. And and it comes from this word formosus, meaning beautifully formed. So when Spanish, when you say that something is hermosa or hermoso, you're saying that it's beautifully formed and it's incredibly poetic. Uh, another fungus that uses this in the scientific name or the binomial is Calvatia craniiformis, which you can see in that picture there on the left. Uh, it's pretty obvious why it's named that. It has the form of a cranium or a brain. It is the brain puffball. Um, very, very cool and edible. Uh, other words that you might be familiar with are nauseous, zealous, so meaning to be full of zeal, to be full of nausea. So when you see that word in a uh, in your field guide or in a name, you'll know that that means it's referring to the shape of or being full of something. 
OMA, you see this all the time, right? Uh, it comes from, so you have the genus Hyphaloma, for example, uh, or Entoloma. Uh, OMA comes from the ancient, or excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, in Hyphaloma, ancient Greek, hyphae meaning web, and then OMA, meaning the edge or the margin, because these fungus generally have like a cobwebby edge or a margin to them. So it's directly relating to and describing what that mushroom looks like. And if you know those words, you can sort of recognize it. And if you see another mushroom with hyphae in it, you're like, oh, that has something to do with web or oma. Oh, that has something to do with the edge or the margin. Um, similarly, the genus Entoloma, ento meaning into, and combined with oma means that the, the margin of the mushroom is rolled in, which is a characteristic of most or some entoloma. All right, so these are words having to do with shape and form. And, and honestly, there are so many words. Obviously, we're not, this isn't a big Latin um, uh, lesson where we're going to learn Latin, but some, I tried to pick out the ones that I think come up pretty often. Um, so we have like hemi, semi, meaning half, and this is semi, uh, quaternarius semi sanguineus, the half blood court, because it's red only underneath. It's really beautiful. That one's back on Cape Cod, where I'm from. Uh, aster or astro meaning star. Here we have, um, this is one of, my, one of my favorite mushrooms too. It's a, a parasitic mushroom on Rustula and it's very cool. Um, armilla, armilla means bracelet and that's actually where armillaria comes from, the honey fungus. Um, you'll notice that they say ringless honey fungus. The reason for that is most of them have a ring and the ring reminded the person who named Armilla, Armal, Armillaria of Armilla, which was a, a bracelet that um, Roman soldiers used to wear up on their arm. And the name comes from the word for arm, which makes sense. Uh, next up we have Corgatus. You see that a lot as a specific epithet. Uh, think of corrugated, like corrugated cardboard. It it's, means it's wrinkled. That's a Quartinarius Corgatus over there. Porous, you see this in, oh my gosh, almost every mushroom name. Um, and that is Pycnoporus fulgens, if I believe correctly, that's here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and porous just means having pores, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Um, brevipes is another one you'll see. This word might sound familiar to you as brief or short, brevipes. So that's Rustula brevipes there on the left. Um, another one that you'll run into often is folius or folia or phylum, and those mean leaves or foliage, uh, tremilla foliacea, I believe there, which is really fun to touch back in Massachusetts again. And last but not least, yimno or gymno, however you want to say it, uh, a word that you might be very familiar with that has this root is gym, gymnasium. The reason that it's uh, called a gymnasium is that originally Olympic athletes would practice in the nude, naked, um, because they did the Olympics naked as well. And so gymno means naked or nude. And uh, it, specifically, this is a uh, gymnosporangium virginiae juniperi. Uh, I believe I got all those correct. Um, again, very common and it has naked spores. So gymnosporangia, naked spore. Um, I'm gonna take a tiny moment to just glance at the chat um, because I'm seeing a lot of uh, action there. Uh, no, just kidding, I don't. Oh, no, I didn't know how to do it. There we go. Gymnopus, naked foot, perfect. For vapes, short foot, um, naked seed. Let's see what somebody said here. I thought it had to do with yellow in Spanish. Um, do you get the cornflower? Yeah, do you get the cornflower bullet there in the Chicago area? Because it is the, such a cool mushroom. Okay, I'm gonna go back to this and we'll, we'll check in on that again later. Um, all right, so common color words is another thing I just wanted to touch on. Again, there is myriad words uh, that have to do with color, but some of the most common ones you'll see, I made a little chart here uh, and you can see the words that are overlaid on the color, that's the color that they are associated with. Something I found really interesting, um, for example, was uh, Arontio or Arontia. So you think Aluria Arontia, the orange pixie cup fungus or the orange peel fungus. Um, that comes, again, this is why I don't like to say Latin name because that comes from Sanskrit actually, uh, meaning which was Naranga, which meant orange tree. And this again, 
relates to Spanish when you think about the word for orange, naranja. Um, and, and how did it go from naranja to orantio? Well, over time, uh, linguistically speaking, especially when you're talking about so far back that people weren't writing things down, uh, there were there were vowel shifts and there were consonant shifts and sometimes words changed because a letter came off or something like that. So you can easily see if you cover naranja with your finger, it becomes oranja and you can see how that over time, especially if it's going ear to mouth instead of being written down, it can become orantio pretty quick. Uh, another interesting thing that I like with the colors is the difference between cinnabarina and cinnabarinus and cinnamomea and cinnamomeus. Um, I kind of always thought those were interchangeable, but it turns out if you think about it, cinnamon itself is brown, whereas cinnabarina, uh, cinnabarinus, which is a, um, uh, what's it called, um, a mineral, it's an orange, orange red mineral. So cinnabarina and cinnabarinus are an orangey red, a very specific color. And then, of course, you have red in the middle, and there's a lot of words that describe red. Uh, rubidus, rufus, rufescens, rosea, coccinea, rubrum. Um, we'll kind of come back to that when we touch, when we touch on a etymology later for rustula, so keep that in mind. Um, black, nigricans, ater, atra, atro, uh, white. There's quite a few words for white. Alba. Uh, alba is actually a dull white, whereas candida means shining, shining white because the original meaning of candid, as in like having a candid conversation, was that you're being true and honest, as in shining. And so it's a very morally loaded word, actually. Um, Thura is a clean or a clear white. And then leuco also means um, white. So if you think of like leuco agaricus, for example. Uh, Greece, theo, both mean gray. Theo calibia is um, an interesting one to think of. And again, like I said, there's a lot more to it, but this is a good, if you can screenshot this or save it for later, that's a, a quick primer on color words. Okay, so we've kind of done the background of just basic words that kind of come up over and over again that you're gonna see. Uh, but I did wanna talk about the etymology of the word mushroom itself and where does the word mushroom come from? And this is gonna get just like a little bit on the wordy side because I'm also a history nerd. And I think it's really fascinating to learn where language comes from and how it's shaped over time by culture and politics and um, economy and you know so, so many factors. All right, so let's dive into this mycological history lesson. Uh, prior to the Norman invasion in 1066, the people living on the island of Great Britain spoke Anglo-Saxon, uh, better known as Old English. This was a sort of Germanic dialect because the Anglos and the Saxons and the Jutes and various other people were these Germanic tribes that had invaded the British Isles after the Romans left in 5 uh, AD. So <laughs> I guess it, what I'm trying to say is it's kind of like a game of musical chairs in Britain, except like a political game of musical chairs. And English, as we know it, evolved over time because of the political forces that wanted the resources of this island known as Great Britain. And it was rich in resources and a number of people invaded and took over. I mean, it was the Celts and then it was Anglo-Saxons. And then after them, it was the Normans who invaded. So prior to the Normans invading in 1066, the word that everybody used for mushroom was swam or spam, which is a really fun word to say, I think. Uh, this came from the Proto-Indo-European word swam, meaning sponge, tree, fungus, or swamp because of the common theme of the spongy, soft, organic material inherent in all three, which you can kind of see, right? You can kind of see how like, yeah, you can associate a sponge and a swamp all together with a mushroom if you don't know what it is. Um, Today, these words still exist in Norwegian as sop, German as der schwam, and Swedish samp. And please, in the comments, if you speak other languages and you're like, oh my gosh, I know a word in my language that uses that or is, or is related to that and means mushroom, please comment there. I'd love to hear about that. So, uh, however, when the Normans, who by the way were Scandinavian Vikings that settled in what is modern day France, they had an agreement with the king of Normandy, essentially, that they would um, protect Normandy in exchange for becoming Christians. I don't know if it's a one-to-one, -one, but um, they invaded Great Britain for a very, very long time, not super successfully until, as we mentioned, 1066, when William the Conqueror 
Uh, actually, he ascended the throne. He actually became king of England in 1066. And not only did he invade the country, but he invaded in the English language as we knew it. It was Old English up until then. And then when the Normans invaded, it became Middle English. And um, it wiped out an estimated 85% of Old English um, with the influx of the Norman language, the Anglo-Norman language. Um, fun fact, English was not even used in English Parliament until the 1300s. So that's, that'll tell you something about when English came to be commonly used. It might be the language of the world now, but it absolutely wasn't a thousand years ago. So Anglo-Norman became the language of the British aristocracy, the property owners, the upper class, you know, the important people, while the peasants and slaves spoke a still Germanic-influenced evolving version of English called Middle English. I'm gonna to get to my point really soon, I promise you. Um, so if you think about the, the class division now, right? So they, um, they subjugated the people of England, of, of Great Britain, and they took over and they took over the parliament, they took over the castle and they took over everything that was in power. Um, but the people who were still there, the peasants and the slaves and everything, still spoke this old language, which is now Middle English. And this explains why we have um, words like pig and pork and cow and beef you have one word that is for the peasants, that is for the people who are actually raising the live animals, pig and cow. Those are both of Germanic origin. Pork and beef are actually of French or Norman or Anglo-Norman origin, because if you have enough privilege that you only ever see an animal when it's dead and cooked on your plate, you're going to have your own language for it. So you can see how there was a divide, a, a great socioeconomic divide there between the people who handled the live animals and spoke one type of language and the people who ate the animals on a plate and spoke a different type of language. This is also why we don't use the word swam anymore because uh, the Anglo-Norman language replaced the Germanic uh, dialect. So linguists suggest that mushroom actually derives from an Anglo-Norman word for moss, moss, moist, uh, which associated with fungi that grew specifically in moss and they called those moisteron. How does moisturon become mushroom? Well, you got to think about this. Literacy was very scarce in Scandinavia, and it only existed in parts of England in the 11th century. So you could surmise that the changes the word underwent had something to do with a country-sized game of telephone, right? Where somebody, you see this cartoon right here, and you can see how the word changes when it's going from ears to lips and on and on and on. So moisturon eventually went under uh, phonological tweaks and it became mushroom or mushron and it made its way into Middle English as mushron or mushron and then eventually somehow down the road became mushroom and that's the story of how we get the word mushroom. Okay so other words uh, other genuses genera sorry genera is plural for genus that mean mushroom. This I feel like is a just a tiny bit of a buzzkill. Um, Mycena, for example, it means tiny mushroom. Uh, myc or myco is the ancient Greek word. Uh, it comes from the ancient Greek word myca, uh, meaning fungus, mushroom, or anything shaped like a mushroom. Um, and people aren't totally sure what the origin of it, of it is, but they think it might come from the Proto-Indo-European muk, meaning slip or slime, which would make sense, right? A lot of mushrooms are viscid and slimy. Um, and this root puts the myco in mycology or mycophage, which are people who love to eat mushrooms or mycophile, fungus lovers. Uh, same goes for mycedo or mycetes or myces. So if you see that in a um, binomial, you, you just know that that has to do with fungus, mushroom, et cetera. Uh, Amanita is another one that just means mushroom, unfortunately. Uh, it comes from the ancient Greek amanites, and it just means mushroom. Uh, people aren't 100% sure why. Why did that word come to mean mushroom? It could be that it's from a mountain named Amanis or a place named Amantia in modern day Albania. They're just really not sure again because things weren't written down. Um, Belit, once again, it means mushroom. It is borrowed um, from Latin belitus. Well, borrowed from Greek into Latin. Uh, something I failed to mention earlier is that a lot of words in Latin are actually borrowed from Greek, meaning stolen. And a, a common thing that they like to do was to change K's to C's and then call it, um, call it Latin. So you'll see as we go through this, a lot of words um, in, in Greek 
have a K, Kronos, change to Latin, Kronos has a C. So for example, uh, Belites just means, just means mushroom. All right, so uh, I'd love to just do a few actual mushroom names and break them down and talk about what they mean. Um, again, it helps you remember the scientific name, the binomial, if you know what the binomial means. So craterellus, it's a mushroom that we're all super familiar with. The genus includes black trumpets, uh, yellow feet, chanterelles, etc. cetera. Uh, if we break it down into its two root words, which by the way, I will do another aside here real quick, which is um, you may notice that I, I, it's possible that I pronounce some of these binomials different than you might or that someone else might. Um, I have my own philosophy on pronunciation. I didn't study Latin. Um, however, it's kind of it's kind of up to the speaker, in my opinion, on how you pronounce a word. Uh, Catherine and I were talking before the talk started about um, Los Angeles, for example. So what's the right way to say Los Angeles? It is not an English word. It's a Spanish word. So if we were to say it the right way, it would be Los Angeles. Um, but we say Los Angeles because we are native English speakers or maybe, you know, for whatever reason. So when people argue about the right way to say something, I think it's kind of six of one and half dozen of the other, potato, potato, as long as you can still communicate what it is specifically that you're talking about. And as long as that person knows what you're saying, it kind of doesn't matter how you pronounce it. Um, that said, I do like to break up a word into its root words. So for example, this one we're gonna break up right now, uh, crater and Ellis. So I would say crater Ellis, whereas I don't think anyone else says this one this way, um, but somebody else might say uh, crat craterellus or craterellus. There's a number of ways that people say things and break them up and, and put the enunciation or the emphasis on different syllables. But personally for myself, I like to break it up into its two root words and say those individually. It just to me, it makes the most sense not to sort of combine and confuse the root words together. So let's begin. Crater and Ellis. Let's do Ellis first because Ellis is actually a suffix I did not cover earlier because I knew I was going to touch on it now. Ellis is in a group of um, uh, suffixes including Celis, Silis, Ellis, Ella, Illis, Isum, Iam, Ulus, Ul, there's, there's actually quite, there's too many to name, but they're all somewhat related. And they are what is known as diminutive suff suffixes. Um, diminutive, diminutive is a word that means small. So it is a suffix that affects the preceding word by making it small. So this, whatever crater means, it's a small crater, if you know what I mean. So now when you see Ellis, Illis, Silis, all of these words, you know that it means small or it's modifying the preceding word to mean small. So where do you think that the word crater comes from? I mean, this is a pretty common word that we know in English, right? Um, maybe it refers to the depression in the top of the mushroom having to do like with a crater on the moon. Here we have a, a crater <laughs> caused by a volcano and um, it is known in modern English as a hole created by, by a volcano or asteroid. Um, in the dictionary. But the thing is, uh, while it is related to crater, the actual meaning where craterellus comes from predates the word crater as it applies to a volcano or a hole in the moon by 2,000 years. This right here is a crater. Uh, holes in the earth were called craters around 1600 CE, whereas the crater on the left here dates back to 400 BC. That is an old, old piece of pottery. Crater comes from the Greek word kara, meaning to mix, which came from the Proto-Indo-European root care, to mix, to confuse, or to cook. So the meaning is little mixing bowl. And the, and the reason why is that the, the crater that you see on the left there was a ceremonial dish used to mix wine and water. So the action of mixing became the name of the object itself, right? Just like we have a mixer today. Um, and it's it's named, it becomes a noun, but initially it was a verb, if you're following that. Um, so craterellus means little mixing bowl. And a fun fact about this, um, 
A cognate is a word that has the same root as another word, but is a different word itself. So for example, chief and jefe are cognates because they both come from the same word, but they're different words. So another cognate is rare. This comes from the same root as care or craterellus. Um, and it means, you know, today it means undercooked, like your steak, what you would ask for your steak rare, meaning undercooked. Um, but even though it's used for meat today, it was not applied to meat until the 1700s, very recent actually in, in uh, linguistic history. Before this, it was just used for eggs. And it makes sense if you think about the fact that if you have a hot liquid and you're just gently stirring a raw egg into that hot liquid, it's going to slightly cook it. That's a fun, fun, cool fact. Uh, a related genus to Craterellus that has a similar etymology is Cantharellus. Obviously, you're very familiar, I'm sure, with this one. Uh, includes chanterelles. This one is from Latin, cantharis, meaning tank it, tankard or pot, and it's actually from ancient Greek, cantharos. See there how they changed the K to the C? Uh, and it was a drinking cup. It, you can see a picture of it down there, and you can kind of see, like, okay, yeah, that it, without the handles, that kind of does look like a chanterelle. It's got that, you know, vase vase shape, but it's really, it's a drinking cup and it's a little drinking cup because it's got the Ellis on the end of it. Um, you know, I actually didn't do this one, so I'm gonna skip through it. <laughs> I ran out of time. Uh, this is another one I've heard interesting pronunciations of. I say gyrometra, I've heard people say gyrometra. Uh, another valid pronunciation is gyrometra and we'll get into why. Uh, Eurometra is an ask on my seat. Some people believe resemble false morels uh, or morels, and they call them false morels. I am on a personal crusade that I would love to share with you guys today about um, not, not doing this, about not saying false morels. Um, and this is just a joke here that I got off of Facebook. Um, you know, we don't call, um, we don't call donkeys false horses and we don't call stools false chairs because they're something else completely and altogether. And I feel that um, when we call something a false this or that, all it does is perpetuate the confusion that people feel and sort of set them up psychologically to feel confused or intimidated when really they're, they're very different. They're very different to look at. I mean, just look at this photo, they're incredibly different. Um, and what we should be doing is encouraging people to learn about the differences and about how to identify them rather than encouraging them to think that they're going to be confused when they find them. So personally, I don't say false morals, but rant over. All right, so gyrometra or gyrometra. We're going to tackle the, uh, the first word, the first root word here first, which is Gyro, and I want you to think of some words that you know that have this word in it. The first one would be a gyroscope, which is a, uh, a device that twists and turns to give your relation in, um, in space. So you have one in your phone, you have one in your GPS, they have them all over the place. Uh, gyrate is an Elvis. This is a photo, I think, um, of him pre-Ed Sullivan. He was filmed from the waist up because of his gyrating, twisting, and they did not like that. And, and then last but not least, you have heroes. Which are, um, they are a Greek sandwich that utilizes meat that is cooked on a turning spit. So you'll kind of see that within this, there's a whole um, theme of twisting or turning. And the reason for that is gyro is a word that comes from ancient Greek, meaning uh, round. And it's by way of Proto-Indo-European root u, meaning to bend or to curve. Now, what does that have to do with the gyrometra? I guess we'll get into that right now. We did gyro, let's do mitra real quick. Uh, Firstnature.com, which is a website I really, really love and use all the time. I think they're UK based um, and they generally tend to give a little snippet of etymology. Um, and that's where I'll go if I'm stumped on something to sort of get a clue to do my research further. Uh, they puzzle over translation of the suffix as headband. And I personally think a better interpretation of it would be headdress. A mitra uh, in ancient Greek was the name for a turban type cloth headdress that was part of the Jewish high priest garb um, at the time. And you can see that in that picture there. He's got a he's got sort of a turban on his head. And then today uh, that word has come to be um, mitre or mitra, um, which is a pointed bishop's hat, which you'll, if you were raised Catholic or if you 
or, you know, watch the Pope on television, you'll see that he wears a pointed hat and that's called a miter. Um, so the word has evolved over time, but it, it has to do with a hat. Um, miter is also in, in common English today. Miter is the joining of two points to form a corner, like in carpentry. Uh, it's also the mitral valve, which you'll see right here, uh, which is formed by two flaps coming together at a point. So, so it's evolved to, in modern English to mean something that's pointed, but originally, um, the original meaning of it was was sort of a soft cloth turban. Um, that brings us to the meaning of the word gyromitra, which is a twisting headdress. And it makes perfect sense if you go back and you look at a picture of a, of a gyromitra, it really does, it's twisting and it's turning and it's up those folds, which is why it's not a false morale. False morales are, hol are hollow, uh, morales are hollow inside. They're not all twisty turbany like that. Um, and so I think personally that's a, um, that etymology can help people remember whether what they're finding is a morale or not, because if it's all twisty and has layers inside like a turban, you know, twisted up and, and cut in half, then it's not a morale. And that's where etymology can help you with its implication. Uh, next, we are going to look at fluorotus. This is a mushroom, hopefully everyone is really familiar with, the oyster mushroom. Uh, they are delicious and pretty easy to identify once you get the hang of it. Uh, again, it's made up of two root words, plur and otis. Let's do plur first because we already touched on otis before, right? That was one of those um, common suffixes we looked at, which has to do with ops or the eye, so the appearance of. Um, plur comes from ancient Greek plura, meaning a rib or a side of something, or in, in modern day, um, we think it's pertaining to the side. So you re may remember pleuro from such um, terrifying medical words as pleurisy, which is a lung disease, creating a pain in the sides, the pleura, um, and basically a lot of other bad health conditions related to the linings of the lungs. Uh, I looked up, I tried to find as many words as I could um, that contained this root, and really it's just, as far as I know, please comment in the chat if you know another word, but um, it just refers to diseases of the lung. And that makes sense, right? Because before they knew what pleurisy was, they knew, ouch, it hurts in my side. And then they began investigating and they found that it was the lung that was causing the pain in the side. Um, oh, those are pictures of pain in people's side. So um, I'm gonna go back real quick. So a pleurotus is named thusly because it grows on the side of a tree, right? So it's the side growth. And then you have the specific epithet, which is Australia, which means oyster. And that's due to the shape of the mushroom. So there you have it. Uh, rustula is a fun one. Uh, those are rustula rosea, and they are actually a really fun rustula that I found um, where one was growing directly out of the top of the other. That's, uh, I didn't do that to them. They were like that when I found them back in Massachusetts. Um, what can you say about Rustula except they're really fun to throw against trees? <laughs> I'm sort of kidding. Um, this is from the Proto-Germanic rustes, meaning rust, which in turn is derived from the Proto-Indo-European rud or rude, um, meaning red. And so the meaning of Rustula is actually red. That's what that means, even though they come in so many different colors frustratingly different colors that makes it incredibly hard to identify them sometimes. Um, other words that you might recognize that come that are cognates, meaning they come from the same root word is ruby, rust, right? There's a red theme here. Uh, rue, if you are a cooking aficionado and you like being in the kitchen and you've ever made a gravy from scratch, you know you have to make a rue first, which is fat and flour browned. So there's a brown element to this as well. Um, next, you have rubella of measles, mumps, and rubella fame. Uh, and the reason that it's called rubella is because it causes a red rash. So that's actually built into that binomial as well. Um, and last but not least, russet potatoes. They have a brownish red color. Um, so it's really interesting, you know, you, even though you might not know what the word rustula meant, you know all these words that mean red or red brown, and that's why they named rustula rustula. This one, I'm getting ready to wrap it up uh, as far as my talk goes. We'll get to the comment section afterwards, but this one is a really interesting one because 
uh, if I had a magic monkey paw that could give me, you know, three wishes, um, one of them would be that I could ask all of the famous taxonomists what the heck they were thinking, to sit down with them and say, what was going on in your life the day that you named this genus or you named, you gave this specific epithet? Because like, it's not always totally clear what they're getting at. And sometimes they get a little bit fancier than they need to. I believe uh, Mark Twain said, never use a $5 wor word when a 25 cent word would do. Um, and that's definitely, they are guilty of doing that. So Strobilomyces is one of those. This is the member of the Bolete family, common no commonly known as the old man of the woods. I have a very fond place in my heart for this mushroom. Um, strobos is an ancient Greek word for the act of whirling. Uh, it comes from Proto-Indo-European streb, meaning wind or turn, um, which makes sense if you think about uh, like a tornado or a or a, um, a funnel turning with wind. Um, and it's also the root of the Greek word strepho, meaning twisted. And some words that you might know in your modern lexicon are streptococcus. So that's a bacteria with a shape that is slightly twisted or turning. Um, strabismus, which is the technical term for crossed eyes. Uh, strap, that's a fun one. That's kind of removed, but it's um, initially a strap was formed by twisting strands of leather together. And last but not least, anyone who's been to a club before the pandemic or maybe a college or I don't know, just really fun in your own house, strobe light, right? So uh, strobe light is the effect of a strobe light is created by a light that turns inside of it to create the strobing effect. Now, what the heck does that have to do with strobilomyces? Well, this is where it gets weird. <laughs> so uh, this is one of those fun quirks of linguistics where a word originally means one thing and often it meant a verb or an action. And then eventually that verb or that action sticks, like we said with a, a stand mixer, that's what it does, but that's become its name as well, sticks to the object itself and it goes from there. So. Strobilomyces is actually named for pine cones. Why? Why? Because, well, you can kind of see in this photo, the top of a Strobilomyces is spiky, kind of like a pine cone. It's got those little tufts, um, fibrillose areas that stick off of it and make it so special to look at and not as fun to eat. Um, and it kind of does look like a pine cone, but what the heck does that have to do with Strobilomyces? Well, a pine cone, uh, is really interesting actually has a, a strong uh, symbolic significance in mythology and anthropology, that, um, which we won't get into now because it's a whole another talk in and of itself. But people thought that pine cones resembled tops because, and they were this whirling and swirling sort of a shape to them. That was just, that was the feel that people got from a pine cone. Um, and the action of whirling got applied to something that whirls atop, which looked like a pine cone. So <laughs> it's a very roundabout way of naming a mushroom. And again, I wish I could sit down with the taxonomist who named Strobilomyces and said, what were you, what were you drinking? <laughs> what were you reading? What were you doing? Um, but that is, that is the origin, as far as I can tell, of the uh, genus Strobilomyces. Uh, Markella. So this is the last one I'm going to do. This is um, it's springtime. I hope you all had a really good morel season in Chicago. It was super dry here in Oregon where I am currently. We actually, April was the driest month on record for Oregon. Um, so we are in a drought, which has been not super fun for mushrooms, but there were some burned mushrooms because we had crazy forest fires in the fall. Um, Markella, one of the most sought after edibles. Again, somebody might say Morcella, totally fine, up to you, potato, potato. Uh, so let's start with that, Morcell. That's the first word here. We already know what Ella means. It's a diminutive, it means it's little. This one's, I found this one to be really surprising to be honest with you. Uh, Morcell is actually not of a Latin, Latin origin, but of a Greek origin. Um, I'm sorry, or Greek origin, it's a German origin, and it is a German word meaning mushroom. Uh, it's also etymologically related to the common name morel, because morcal, morchel, they're kind of, you can see how they're very similar. Um, both of them come from the diminutive of proto-Germanic, meaning pre-Germanic, murho, which was a wild carrot 
um, or an edible root. And that in turn, they believe came from PIE, mork, meaning tuber or edible herb. So the idea there is that someone somewhere thought, you know, I don't know what this thing is. Maybe it's a carrot, maybe it's a tuber, maybe it's a root, I don't know, and it stuck. And, and that word became the word for mushroom long down the line. Now, I'm gonna leave you with a fun fact, which is that taxonomist Carl Linnaeus who is both a problematic figure um, when it comes to racism in science, um, but is also the father of modern taxonomy as we know it. Before he created the modern taxonomical system, it was a cluster you know what of trying to determine what went where and what was related to where. And of course now in modern day, we have DNA and genetic analysis, which is throwing all of that for a loop once again. I think maybe I'd love to hear your comments in the section. When do you guys think that taxonomy is going to settle down? Like, when, when do you think we can like publish books again and just be like, this is the name, this is it? <laughs> 10 years, 20 years, less, more? I'd, I'm interested to know. Um, so taxonomist Carl Linnaeus originally named morels Phallus esculenta. Esculenta is a word that means delicious or edible. And Phallus... I think most of us know what that means. So I, I think we should all count ourselves grateful that Linnaeus's name did not stick. Uh, it did not take, it's not considered viable uh, because otherwise we would be calling them phallus esculenta, delicious penises. That's it. Um, let's see, I have a, um, that is the last slide that I have here. Uh, I did wanna have another slide for you guys giving some information on the sites that I use most primarily to do my etymological research. So I'll just tell you about those. Um, etym online, E T Y M online.com is a site I've been using for 15, 20 years. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, Wiktionary, which is like Wikipedia, but it's a dictionary, is really, really helpful. And I think I mentioned earlier that firstnature.com, which is a UK based um, uh, mycology site, also gives tidbits on etymology, which I find really, really helpful if you wanna just do your own research and get into it yourself. Uh, so as far as my, as my top goes, uh, those are, you know, I, I, I know a lot more etymologies, um, but so I would, uh, I would be really interested in answering your questions if you have any um, in the chat. And I wanna thank you all for coming to my talk today. Yes, that was quite interesting. <laughs> I'm stunned by some of these things. <laughs> which, which specifically, do you, do you know? Oh, I like that whirlwind one. Yeah. You know, that, that was quite interesting. And there's actually quite a few mushrooms I wanted, I wanted to include more. So for example, turbinellus, um, ha, again, has to do with that whirling, swirling, tur if you think of modern words like turbine, um, that has to do with, and there's a few other um, mushrooms that have similar names that have to do with sort of like swirling or, or tornado shapes, which I, I again, I don't know because I can't ask the taxonomist why, but um, you know, what, what was in their head the day they decided like, yes, that's the obscure Latin or Greek or Proto-Germanic name that I want to use for this mushroom. Yeah, well, I, I see we have, um... Tom Volk here, I think he just, oh yeah, right here. And we have Patrick, do you guys have any thoughts on the nomenclature, especially now with DNA and all that involved? I was first want to say, Annie, you did a really good job on this. Um, I teach Latin and Greek for scientists at uh, University of Wisconsin La Crosse. And you did a really jo good job of explaining all the things and giving examples. This actually the same kind of examples I give. So congratulations, very good, I'm impressed. Thank you so much. As as far as when taxonomy is going to solidify is going to stabilize, uh, good luck. <laughs> um, I think it's more stable now than it was perhaps ten years ago. There's st we're starting to figure out some things, some things that are, um, you know, that are um, starting to become more clarified as we get more DNA sequences. Um, but there's always going to be changes that happen when we get a new technique. What's going to happen? Um, one of the things that, that has happened that I'm not excited about is the proliferation of too many names, like in the Bolites. I'm not impressed with any of those names. 
Um, and so I'm not going to use them until I, that all became stabilized. That was kind of a mistake to allow the publication of those names. Mm. Um, but that being said, as I get older, I am less interested in what to call things and more interested in what these things are doing in nature. And so, um, you know, I, I'll leave the, um, you know, the actual renaming of things to people who are more interested in that. I very much share that sentiment. I mean, it is, I do think it's important, but at the end of the day, um, we could get lost in semantics and, and what's, what are what is our goal in the end? Um, something that I find interesting is that there is only one, even though there's, I mean, how many dog breeds can you think of? You can probably think of at least a hundred dog breeds, but there's only one binomial for dogs. There's only one. Uh, so it's interesting because you can go, you can go so far in the direction of getting as specific as you want. And yet we seem to somehow manage to talk about dogs. You know, well, we don't, we don't need them. So that does, that is very different. Um, but we somehow managed to differentiate things and understand concepts, even though they don't go into splitting hairs over dogs in the binomial nomenclature. When you get into the artificial selection like that, where people are breeding for particular traits over the course of, you know, 50 or hundred years, sometimes you get these weird yeah. things that probably shouldn't exist. <laughs> don't you think that is somewhat similar though to mushrooms? Because it is, seeing- I agree. We're seeing so much, it it wasn't artificial, but yet what we've learned from genetic analysis is that you might have two mushrooms that look exactly the same, but it turns out there's, they've diverged along the evolutionary path somewhere and they just happen to look the same. And so, um, you know, this one's not a bully anymore. It's something else, or um, it belongs to a different family. And there's just so much genetic diversity that it's almost similar to a artificial system in which we've created this wild genetic diversity. It's just Mother Nature doing it instead. I'm going to share my one Star Trek quote that I know, and that's that Mr. Spock said, a difference that makes no difference is no difference. Mr. Volk, you just made me so happy. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I have a dog (laughs) named after a Star Trek character. (laughs) I sense that. (laughs) A difference that makes, would you repeat it? A difference that makes no difference is no difference. Thank you. I love that. Write that down, get a pillow embroidered with that. <laughs> Patrick, what do you think about that, about the stabilization? Um, I agree with other you and other people that the Boley mess is not really stable. Um, to point that out, the, um, the um, frosty eye is in a different genus now than what Anna used. So according to Nixon Gorham. So it's like, it's, uh, people don't even agree on where to put it. So, but um, I also mentioned that um, part, of the ma- part of the reason Boletus is a mess is that people did not, when they did DNA sequencing, they realized that Boletus was um, what we can call paraphyletic. The genus concept didn't include all the members that came from the same ancestor because we were already using other genus names like Strobomyces and Luxinum. And people did not want to lump those back into Boletus. So instead of lumping things into a bigger genus Boletus, we had to keep, they had to keep splitting things up until they were all their own branches. That's um, why part of the reason it's so messy. But we have other genera like Ammonita and Cortinarius, which no, I mean, very few people have a problem with how big those genera are. And if you think about Cortinarius, it's just as diverse as um, all the different boletes put together too. But we're fine with one big genus of, I don't know, a thousand species or whatever it is. So why are we making bolete genera that only have three or four or five species? That doesn't make sense to me. But I agree also with Tom that um, Anna, you had a, it was a very, it's a very good talk. I'll put you Thank down. you. Oh, somebody asked in the comments if mucus was connected and it would be really, it would seem to make a lot of sense if mucus was connected to mm. mu- mucus, uh, but apparently according to linguists, it is not, which is weird. So I don't know, but 
that is uh, maybe Mr. Vogt can say more about it, but um, in my reading, it's not connected or, or they're unsure and they don't have evidence to support it. Um, there's a couple of mushrooms with the mucos mucosus as an epithet and they're usually slimy. Yes, that mucosa, but somebody asked if mucus was related to mycus or myco, the right. same root. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't think we know that. I don't know that. We don't know. <laughs> but we don't know is a valid answer too. I also agree with you that a lot of, um, some people that publish scientific names now will give the etymology of where the word is coming, where the words are coming from, but a lot of the people, you know, hundred years ago or more did not do that. So that's, that is a bit of a mystery on some of these names. Yeah, we'll never know. Like, like Ogala, uh, I, I tried to research, you know, what, why did that taxonomist feel that, you know, uh, that slime mold resembled the mammary glands of a wolf? Like, what was that something he was researching previously? Like, what was going on in his world that he thought, these look like wolf mammary glands? Uh, well, well, I don't, it might be related to folklore in that area of people yeah. trying to explain what this funky stuff was. Yeah. Yeah. But we have lycogala, lycopyrdon, and lyco, uh, lycopodium. Lycopersicon, too. Oh, lycopersicon. Tomato. Right. The wolf's peach. And the specific epithet Lycoperdoides right. um, for Astrophora as well, which is interesting. Yep. Yep. I, There's uh, also a Scleroderma variolatum, which when I was learning mushroom names, it was Scleroderma Lycoperdoides because it looked like a little puffball. Aha. Uh -huh. That makes sense. Astrophora lycoperdoides, they, you can't often see their gills and they are very powdery and puffy and they could look like little puffballs. Yeah, uh, a, an interesting etymology that I didn't include here because it's, it's complicated is um, a scleroderma septentrionale, which is a Northern septentrionale meaning Northern, but it means Northern by way of, of the North, uh, uh, um, an asterism, which is smaller than um, a, a constellation apparently, um, in the northern sky that some people originally thought resembled seven oxen, so sept, pentrionale, seven. Um, they thought it resembled seven oxen turning around um, a central point as they would have if they were, ch you know, uh, chaffing wheat. Um, and so uh, that that asterism that was in the northern sky came to mean northern, and so that um, that scleroderma is a is known typically to be in the north. Yeah, so that's yeah. That there's, there's a bunch of uh, different uh, folklore, very old stories having to do with the Big Dipper and the, the constellation group with the Big Dipper, Little Dipper. A lot of yeah. them to do with um, one or more people hunting animals. Yeah. Anything else about this topic? Um, I, since we got Tom here, um, Tom, what do you think of the origin of agaricus? I was tracking it down. It seemed one idea is that it's from the um, a word uh, resembling agaricon. It was for a big white medicinal polypore down there in the Mediterranean area on trees. I was. I always thought that it just came from. I thought they. That was just a Latin word for mushroom. Okay. And I don't know where it came from be before that. There's some thoughts, um, or I think that um, Linnaeus, who was the first one to give some of our, he gave like a dozen genus names, but I think he mixed up how he used Amanita and Boletus and Agaricus. I think he's mixed, mixed those up as to what kind so He of called everything that had gills ag Agaricus. Right. And so that, that kind of lead, leads against your agaricon hypothesis, because right. of course there's no gills in that. Right, but I, I, there's, um, I should look it up, but there's some evidence that he used Boletus and Ammonite wrong too, or whoever came up with Ammonite. That's probably likely. 
a lot of mistakes and blind alleys in in nomenclature. Yeah. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Volk, for your website because it's where I go to to learn how to say things a lot. So good. So I, I and I appreciate that you said it doesn't matter how you pronounce things. That is my total feeling on it. You do use some different pronunciations than um, many of us are used to, but I don't care about that. <laughs> I think it's. I think you can, and, and that's part of the reason that some people are hesitant about uh, scientific names is because they're afraid to say them. Yeah. And so I, I would um, appreciate everyone accepting people for what they, how they say things. And if you can understand them, who cares if it's the same as you? That's the point of language is to be understood. Yep. yep. So thank you. Absolutely. But I remember when I was first acquainted with the Illinois Mycological Association, there was a tape that was circulated and one side was Rolf Singer pronouncing things, Latin names with a European accent. And there was somebody else doing it with an American accent. Alex Smith. Yes, that was fascinating to listen to. I used to have a copy. I don't know where it is anymore. But if somebody has a link to that, that could be interesting for you, Anna, just to hear for the fun of it. I would love to see that if anyone has a link to it, yeah. Anything else? I think you left us speechless. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great with a, with a topic all about language, right? <laughs> well, I, I just want to thank you all again for coming and I want to thank you for your kind words. And, um, and for, for Kelly Bauer it. for highlighting you. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly, so much. I appreciate all of you. Um, and I, uh, I'm grateful to be here and I hope that you have a really great mushroom season ahead of you. And then and I, I also remember, by the way, just so you all be thrilled because, you know, uh, Michael Quo is somebody that we have supported and been involved with over the years. And Anna was quite excited to have one of her mushroom pictures and observations highlighted on his website. Yeah, I screenshotted an email that I think I got from him and I was like, oh, Michael emailed me. So yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big fan. I'm a real big fan. <laughs> Yeah, you were just as excited when I told you Tom Volk was online tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Absolutely. everybody has their rock star. It's just who is it, right? Exactly. Like I said, very into Star Trek, very into mushroom nerds. I don't know most celebrities on TV, but I know who Michael Kuo and Tom Volk are. <laughs> right. Thank you, and we'll see you in a few weeks. And Anna, thank you again for coming today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hey, good Bye. luck. Thank you.